Today's businesses are on a vigilant watch for threats in an ongoing cyber war. It's time to get real-world solutions to protect and secure your valuable business information anytime, anywhere. Welcome to Cybersecurity America with Josh Nicholson. You're about to gain special access into a world of restricted information and a backstage pass to the inner sanctum of cybersecurity operations. Here's your host, Joshua Nicholson. Before I show, a quick word from our sponsor, Deep Seas. Thank you, Josh. There are a couple of reports that I want to bring up that came across the CTI desk here at Deep Seas. The first one being the supply chain compromise of 3CX, which is a VoIP and IPBX software provider that was the subject of a supply chain attack where suspected North Korean actors were able to take two malicious DL files that contained digital signatures that were still recognized as safe by Windows by actually exploiting a 10-year-old vulnerability. That vulnerability, which is tracked as 2013-39, was actually an opt-in vulnerability where Windows would not inform customer whether or not the digital signature fit every line of code that existed within the program if it had been edited. But if users did opt in, they would receive a warning that the object didn't match the digital signature. Unfortunately, it would appear that anyone who upgraded to Windows 11, even if they had opted in on that warning, would not receive it any longer. It would go back to default on Windows 11. So there's a lot of risk surface here to the vulnerability that was used. Back to how the 3CX attack actually worked. This is where uh, users would download 3CX application, the desktop application for Windows, and then there would be DLL sideloading of two malicious DLLs that contained some code in, code that would then inject info stealers that were likely leading back to North Korean actors to try to collect as much information as possible. And this went on for several months without any discovery until several different customers had been a compromised and then we saw a lot of security companies come out and release some of the indicators of compromise that were involved with that as well as yar rules and some other detection signatures involved this isn't surprising given the way that we've seen north korea operate in the past we have seen them increasing tensions with missile strikes and becoming a little bit more prevalent on the world stage since the COVID-19 pandemic seemed to have softened down a lot of North Korean activity. But with a lot of the increase in hostilities and a lot of diplomatic pressure going on, there are a lot of countries in, the, in different regions, both Asia as well as what we're seeing coming out of Russia. We anticipate to see a lot more cyber activity from these threat actors coming out. Speaking of an increase of cyber activity, NCC Group released a report earlier this week that highlighted an increase in ransomware activity, specifically a, an increase of 45% between January and February of this year with ransomware activity primarily being led by LockBit 3.0. This goes along with reporting that we saw late in the year and early in 2023, suggesting that ransomware operations had decreased by 23% or more according to some security researchers. Here at Deep Seas, our assessment of that kind of information was taken that a lot of these ransomware operators had not actually decreased their activity, but adjusted their activity to support Russia in Ukraine by targeting Ukrainian organizations as well as NATO, and that there wasn't actually a decrease necessarily in the activity, just in the targeting itself. And perhaps the activity decreased by number, but there was no nothing that we saw that would have predicated the idea that ransomware operations were going to be on any sort of downtrend heading into 2023. And we advised all of our clients not to assume that ransomware was to become less of a threat. The increase that is seen was the highest that NCC has ever recorded, a 45% increase, 
but this does look a lot like a return to normal and, and, and the generalized increasing that we see in ransomware activity. Obviously, with quarter one numbers coming out, we may be able to analyze that a little bit deeper and say whether or not there's a qualitative increase in ransomware activity. But I will say that the likelihood of ransomware going anywhere in the near future is not, it's just not something that we anticipate ever. And everyone should still be cautious of cyber criminality and ransomware activity. Just because there was a decrease last year, we do assess that was related to support heading towards Russia and more targeting going on towards Ukraine rather than commercial is that we see, but we do anticipate a return to normal and normal increases right now of ransomware activity. But that those numbers might be skewed a little bit because of how little we did see in 2022 during Russia's initial invasion into Ukraine. But we'll continue to monitor the threat landscape here at Deep Seas CTI, and we'll pass it back over to you, Josh. Thank you. Wow, what a whirlwind we've had here. We're now on to our 12th episode. So the first 10 were a whirlwind. 11th was a great. We did that on women in diversity and cybersecurity. Since then, the channel has developed, and we're now on Apple. So we're on that platform as well, Spotify. Voice of America has done a great job just being able to get the show out there into a number of different hands. We're about like 4,000 downloads. We also launched this into a YouTube podcast, so you'll see that on the Cybersecurity America YouTube channel. So I really highly encourage you to go there, subscribe to it, hit like. We really want to hear your feedback and comments. That's been taking off, and we're still a little bit behind getting some of the older episodes, their video ready to get online, but really soon you'll be able to have both of those. And so today, though, I think we have a really special treat because a lot of the focus I'm dealing on at work right now, we have over at Deep Seas, we have over 300 plus customers. And so we have a real need and a lot of demand signal coming about security operation centers. What works, what doesn't, what is the right mix of on-site versus off-site? How do you use a hybrid approach such as manage detection and response in your tool set? How do you get to where it's an economical model that you can sustain having an operations moving forward and do it in a very secure model and manner? So part of the things that we wanted to do today, I got a very special guest. His name is Paul Dwyer, and Paul has just years of experience. He's supposed a, a global IBM secure their partner with more than 500 clients across a wide range of industries, including financial services, utilities, transportation, consumer industry products, government, and defense industries. Mr. Dwyer has worked with companies around the world that develop business-driven enterprise security strategies, implemented programs to establish and transform more than 300 security operation centers, SOC strategies, SOC design, implementation, operation and optimization. Now in the last three years, Mr. Dwyer has pioneered IBM's work on risk analytic centers, or fusion centers, with select clients in Europe, North Africa, and South America. The Risk Analytics Center work features a strong business case with an average savings of more than one million per use case. So he has extensive research and development in conjunction with IBM's research lab and Watson's research labs, including advanced security analytic methods and techniques using both SIM and big data analytic tools to identify, prevent, and minimize business impact and financial loss due to cyber threats, cyber crime, or cyber fraud. Mr. Dwyer is an IBM inventor with multiple patents related to security operations and security modeling, advanced threat disposition scoring, advanced rule analytics, SOC strategy design implementation methods, and operational control frameworks. SOC predictive and analytic techniques, SOC cognitive analytic techniques, and SOC development and optimization, optimization accelerators. So in the last five years, Paul has reviewed and helped and set up and optimized more than 450 security operations worldwide across nearly every industry, including banking, insurance, chemicals, retail, consumer, industrial products, transportation, healthcare, banking, insurance, and, all, and so forth. Wow, welcome to the show, Paul. What a rich background. I know there's not a lot to your background to cover, but anything I missed there? Just that I'm a retired IBM partner. I'm now working as an independent consultant, working deep seas, helping kind of leverage, I guess, my experience and industry expertise and helping helping us deliver a better set of services and products to support clients in this space. So it's great to be here, Josh. Thank you. 
Oh, yeah, thank you. And it's always great to be able to take some time and think about the overall structure and strategy and operations and to be able to, to do that after your day-to-day -day job. So it was great to have this this time with you. Man, I've been waiting to ask you some of these questions. So you've really been there, done this at the enterprise level. What have been your thoughts and some of the things you've seen develop over the years? Obviously, this security operations center moved to cloud and more expense management with cloud logs and just some of the complexities. But I wanted to get your thought on 2022. What do you see is 2023. And when you start to talk about the methodology developed, I saw that intellectual property and that really helps to refine a security operation. So what where do you get that from? How did that how did you go and go about the methodology for developing it? And just some information related to that. Sure. So I think we started this work, I don't know, it was probably 12 years ago when we first built out our first security operations center. And I think at that point, the state of the art was that in most cases, clients were going to MSPs or managed security services providers. We were trying to get some type of security operations center set up, but this is going back to 2012. And back in 2012, the idea of a security operations center was relatively new. And if you talk to 10 people, even in the same client, you typically got 10 different definitions of what a security operations center was or could be. So I think a lot of the work starting out years ago is trying to define what's the operating model for a security operations center. And the way that we went about that work is we worked with a number of top, back then banks were the first ones moving into the space. So we did a lot of work in the banking industry. And what we did is we started to work with them to define what the requirements were for a security operations center. But more importantly, and my background's in management consulting. So I'm, I grew up as a management consultant. I got introduced to cyber back in this 2012, 2013 timeframe. And the way that in management consulting, when we design a new function, we do what's called an activity analysis. That is, we look at what this new function is going to do, what activities are they going to perform? And we try to organize those activities into plan, build and transform and run. And we did the same thing for a security operations center. So we started to talk about what does a SOC need to do? What are the key activities? And one of the really interesting things that came out of that, that I think was an eye opener, certainly for a lot of our clients, and I think even for some of us that you know have been working in this space is that, as you start to do that activity analysis about what a security operations center does, the name operations is really misleading because it makes it sound like this is just a black box backroom operational function. And it also makes it sound like every day is the same where it's just operations, you're just keeping the lights on and running. It really does a disservice to what the purpose or mission is of a security operations center because the reality is that a security operations center is not a static operational capability. It is very dynamic. And I think the best security operations centers I've seen globally have understood and really embraced that. So when we look at the activities and the activities then drive, how do you staff a security operations center? What we came to is the fact that about 20% of the work in a security operations center is planning, about 50 to 60% is build and transform, and only about 25 or 30% of the work is what I'd call core operations. So when you understand that about a security operations center, it also starts to suggest a different staffing model. And that is, you need some staff on a security operations center that can do the constant build and transform. And what are they typically working on? They're working on new methods of threat detection. They're working on new response procedures. They're working on new types of analytics to identify more of the unknown threats. So when you start to put all that together, a security operations center, a well-functioning one, has the resources to do the planning so that you're always planning ahead for the next few phases. You're always maintaining a multi-year plan and strategy on how you're going to evolve your security operations center detection, prevention, and response capabilities. But then you've also got the staff and the team to work on ongoing transformation to build those things out, the new methods of detection, the new types of analytics, improved metrics, improved response procedures. All of that work involves a lot of development work. Some of it's procedural, some of it's technology-based, some of it's classic development, but that's an important thing. And if you do those things right, your operational component then becomes about 25 or 30% of your operations. And if you're not anticipating that in what you're building out, you're potentially at a disadvantage. And I would say that's for the bigger, more sophisticated clients and the mid-market clients and the smaller ones. I think it's more about creating a cost-effective but efficient operating model that you can detect the major threats, that you're monitoring the proper things, and that you've got the right partners in place so that if anything big breaks, you've got people that you can rely on to help backstop you and your team so that one incident doesn't completely overwhelm your organization. You've got some people to help you work through, analyze these things, prioritize it. Because I think that's another common factor that we've seen in a lot of attacks is that sometimes there'll be a masking attack that will take people's attention away, like a big DDoS attack. 
everybody starts to focus on that and that creates the opportunity for other things to come in. So that's really why it's important to be able to handle multiple events and to be able to have the staffing and resources either internally or in a combination of internally and partners to be able to deal with those things. And then I think in, in the smaller clients that are still moving into this space and still trying to figure it out, I think one of the big lessons learned is you can't buy your way out of this with technology. And I think that's the other thing we've seen a lot of is people just buy a lot of products, a lot of point solutions and install them. Don't make full use of those capabilities, never really fully deploy it, but they've spent a lot of money. They've taken a lot of time and resources and, and they, what they haven't ended up with is a really integrated, fully functioning system, either from a process standpoint or a technical platform standpoint. And that those are really major issues. And obviously from an organizational standpoint, if you haven't provided for some of those things, but I think those are some of the big lessons learned that we've seen and that it's important for people to make sure that they understand what activities you're gonna be performing internally and you design your organization to do that. And if you're gonna outsource some of those activities, then at least you make sure that the people that you're outsourcing or partnering with that they have the right skills and capabilities to be able to provide the support you need to supplement what you can do with your internal team. And I'd say that's probably the most common model we've seen is the hybrid model. Where you're doing some things internally, but you're really relying on some external partners to help you do maybe some of the deeper threat research, maybe some of the more advanced analytics, some of the ML and AI work. It's better to have partners do some of that. And a lot of this stuff is becoming somewhat commoditized now where you can get that stuff almost as a service from the cloud in terms of applying some of those advanced analytics. And that's definitely where we see a lot of the industry going now. Yeah, I think part of the thing that we're seeing a real good trend on is that the understanding that is the final state of the security operator, you have to understand you have to have partners. It's an ecosystem for you to deliver. If you really think you're gonna hire and staff all the positions necessary and keep them engaged and keep them mentored and trained and everything, while you're trying to run your business, it's no longer an if or when you're going to have a security incident. So does it make sense to say, hey, I want to make cars or I, mean, I want to make shoes, whatever the business's job is, what they want to function on. And they want to have a trusted provider that says, I want to leverage Deep Seas, for instance, in this case, where you're in understanding how to run these operation centers, how to do this effectively, how to do an assessment, not just from a big enterprise perspective, but from a small medium company? How do these models trend down? If you have a second, how, let's talk about how do you do that for a smaller business? How, do, how would you take the, sm the smaller companies and be able to understand what kind of security operations or MDR functions would they need in these situations? I think it's very similar. What we take a look at is what are your, first of all, we can start with what are your current set of capabilities? So let's baseline on what you can do today. And then let's compare that to what we think you need to be able to have to be able to do an effective job of cost effectively finding threats in your environment, being able to respond to those threats, but also more importantly, taking that information and using it further upstream with some of the other technical towers to make sure that they're doing the prevention necessary. Because smaller organizations, where I've seen them be most effective is there is a lot more concentration on preventing bad things from happening versus creating a big team of people to detect it and try to fix things. Normally there isn't the funding to do that. And I've seen some really effective models where a very small team, I've seen teams as small as five or six people working in a security operations center with a partner that's providing the 24 by seven monitoring, et cetera. But as long as you focus on prevention, it really dramatically reduces the workload and complexity of what you've got to deal with in your security operations center. So I really can't emphasize that enough, that a dollar spent on prevention is way better than $1,000 spent on detection and response. And so for smaller clients, that really needs to be the focus is how can I keep the bad behaviors from happening? How can I keep my customers and my clients from accessing websites that are potentially going to be dangerous or could introduce malware or other things into the environment? I think it's also important that you've got the right endpoint detection capabilities so that if you do see find something introduced on your endpoints, which is the most common place that we see issues, especially with the proliferation of phishing attacks now, the endpoints are typically one of the areas that are targeted most frequently and most often, and they're often the place that people haven't done the right work to make sure that you've got the basic antivirus software in place, but then you also got to be monitoring the logs from those endpoints to make sure that if you are seeing unusual behaviors that you can quickly lock in on that. And we talk about dwell time, which is the time for it takes to detect something to then it takes the time to then remediate it. And dwell time, as I understand in 2022, is running about 56 days, which is down about 25% from 2021. But that's your goal as a small client, is how can I really decrease that dwell time? And you do that, number one, by, by doing a lot more prevention. 
So you have fewer incidents that you have to focus on. Those fewer incidents are going to be easier for us to identify and spot. And then having a very clear, concise set of response guidelines so that when you do find those things, whether it's a malware or whatever it happens to be, that you know what steps you're going to take either internally or with your partners to be able to then mitigate and remediate that. I think the other part of this, especially as a small client, is you have to be very careful because while these SIM tools are phenomenal, they are crazy expensive, really expensive. And I think what happens to a lot of smaller clients is they can fall into the trap of, let's just put everything we can through the SIM tools. Heard that one. The idea being that if I just have everything going through there, then anything bad that happens, I'll be able to detect it. But there's a breakdown in understanding there. And a lot of times it comes from us because probably everybody who's listening to this may have seen these kind of classic funnel charts that show 5 billion events at the top and then you know a bunch of layers and out the bottom pops three or four events. That's really misleading because what it says to the executives or people inside the organization is, if there's 5 billion events coming in, you must be analyzing all 5 billion. And the reality is, I don't know of any client, regardless of their size sophistication, that is analyzing 100% of the data that comes into their SIM platforms. Now, what we like to see is 40 to 50% of the data that's coming in is being analyzed and that the other elements that are coming in, if they're not being analyzed now, that I have future use cases that I'm going to use. But if you're putting data through a SIM that you don't currently have any need for, and you don't have any future plans to be able to do anything with that data, you've really stepped back and say, is that the best way to handle this? Or should I potentially look at some type of a more cost-effective log management solution that will collect a lot of logs or have a record of those logs, do some basic reporting and analysis, but you can do that much more cheaply outside of a SIM environment. I think that's another area where some of the smaller mid-market customers are getting a lot more sophisticated in terms of being selective about what they're putting into the SIM and starting to look at the cost benefits of potentially separating log management from your SIM analytics or even some of your more advanced big data analytics. I think those are some really key elements for some of the smaller customers and finding the right partner to help you. Yeah, and I, I agree with all those. I, one of the moves I've seen, so back in, in the old days, the first SIM sock I stood up was, I don't know, 18 years ago. And so at that time, you'd buy hardware, you'd depreciate it over three years, you'd have some NAS storage, and you were often... Pretty much your storage cost was based on the drive space. Maybe you extended it by a bay. You buy, bought those IBM disk arrays that used to have the big packs of them for the NAS drives. And so you just expand it. Now, when you go to the cloud, it's the first time in my life, my entire career, I've had the bean counters forcing me to explain and justify every log source that comes in to the SIM because the bill is through the And then so exactly what we, and we do manage detection response and SIM work for customers around the world. That's what Deep Seas does. One of the things that we really noticed was that mentality too, where you would have the security ops or tools team would say, hey, we just deployed this new tool to do X, Y, and Z. We're just gonna slam it into the SIM, just send all its logs into the SIM and they'll figure out what to do about it. And what was happening, we saw SOC managers going, I don't know how to stop this. I have a flood of data of saying, here's this new data source, once you tap into this, as if it, everything just works magically once you do that. And it was, we had to put governance in place and stop that and said, instead of throwing everything into the SIM, we'll build analytics around that. There's got to be a governance indoor in the beginning and say, okay, so what is it you want to know from that activity? So you put some zero trust model in, some technology zero trust enforcement. What do you want to know is bad when that goes off? And what does that event need to be processed from the security operations team. Just think of it from a SOX perspective. How do I monitor that actual control? And there always seems to be a breakdown. The security team knows what to, what they want to implement. They want to do some HTTP proxy and they want to do some WAF filtering. They want to, do, they want to accomplish some technical tasks. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the SOC is just being thrown data and trying to figure out what exactly that tool does and what should be recorded on there and so forth. And yeah, see this collision that's happening between them and you almost want to have to say stop governance is part of this we have to justify first of all start with use cases what are you trying to solve what is the use case here then understand what's the data sources that support that and then does it need to be in the sim like for instance one of the ones we did is we had a big sim implementation and we said okay tier one is all the events that are coming in that we do manage detection response for is api driven CrowdStrike, everything that's the EDR, ability to response, re respond within our Domesto platform. That was tier one. 
Everything else that supported other lower fidelity or lower value use cases was tier two. Firewall logs were an example of that. The SIMs filling up a third of the logs are ASA or checkpoint firewalls. Yes, yep. should you should you store them for forensics reasons and your ability to go back if need be? Absolutely. But does that have to go in the SIM and eat in events per second for it? And its use cases really are only horizontal and vertical scanning and port scanning by IP or port scanning through the port ranges on an individual. Now that worked great as the only control we had in OT environments. So you were looking for SQL Slam and other things that have gone off and it really was by network traffic because you have to stay passive in the OT side. What we notice is if we take it out of the SIM and we say, okay, that tier two data is great, we still want it, but we're gonna put that into our post-exploitation or hunt stack. And then, so that data can still be part of hunt plans. It could still be part of forensic analysis and so forth, but it's not online. It falls into enterprise search now more than it does into uh, into the sim so are you seeing that too as well the shifting like we we moved firewall logs to s3 buckets and used athena on the front end to query those and that was a good enough solution for the firewall logs because they didn't all correspond to everything else but what have you seen what i've seen is that for, first of all i would say the bulk of the organizations at the middle and smaller size are still going down the road of everything goes to the sim because it's just convenient. It's a tool. They know that they've got locked down audit trail of what those logs look like. So they can at least check the box from a regulatory standpoint that says, are you collecting your logs? You're supposed to be analyzing them too, but at least you have a way of collecting them so that you've got the opportunity to analyze them if you need to. I still think that the mid-market and smaller clients are showing it. The larger clients, they realized several years ago that their EPS costs, their, the costs of the event processing, the number of events that you're paying for, relative to the number of events you're analyzing, we're just getting further and further out of whack. We did some analysis with some clients that were spending in excess of $5 million a year on their EPS licensing. And when you looked at what they were analyzing and what they were putting through the SIM, they were analyzing less than one one thousandth of a percent or one ten thousandth of what they were putting through the platform. So I think those big clients have already started to move into understanding that I need some type of SIM platform to do real-time analytics. I need some type of log management environment to be able to cost-effectively store logs and to be able to efficiently search those logs. I think that's the other side, downside of SIM tools, is a lot of times you put all your logs in there, you don't have very efficient searching capabilities, the searching. And if you try to run some of those searches during the daytime or any time that the SIM is actually running and functioning, which you can really impact the performance of the SIM and that can cause you to bypass events. So there, there's a lot of issues if you don't step back and say, what's the most effective tool to do the job? And I think for the larger clients, having a log management capability in addition to a SIM, and I think the other part is now starting to look at more advanced analytics and saying, how do I apply machine learning to the environment? How do I apply more AI types of analytics, which are particularly effective at finding the unknown threats? SIMs don't really avail themselves of those types of analytics. They tend to have proprietary databases. You've got to write complex APIs to access the data. It's not very efficient. And so I think for those reasons, what I'm seeing at the enterprise level are clients now looking at a log management solution, a SIM solution, and then some type of advanced analytics platform that, that those three things work together. And it gives you three different ways of saying, if I've got a log that I've got to maintain or analyze, what's the most efficient way for me to do it rather than treating your SIM as this, all I've got is a hammer, so everything looks like a nail problem, which doesn't really work long-term. And I think we're seeing more and more middle clients, middle market clients looking at that now because the cost savings, if you can right size your EPS licensing, can help you fund some of what you need to buy in terms of some of that additional storage capacity and other things to be able to set up in an analytics environment and some type of log management capability. Oh yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. I think there is a misunderstanding that you start with SIM. I think you start with a logging strategy and figure out what events are important to you on what devices in what manner and at what verbosity and yep. how does that map to use cases that may occur in the future and then being able to do that proper config setting on the endpoints too so not just having all data that you may want filtered having it filtered at the ingestion level rather than at the generation level so you're not dealing with all this eps and all this stuff coming in that you're just going to drop anyway you're not going to ingest to have a strategy where you're pushing that closer towards the endpoint and saying a lot of times i don't ever see standard logging configuration settings in enterprises like i can understand small business right 
But yeah. even in enterprises, nothing says we're logging this way and this is the decision we made on the Cisco routers, for instance. Right. And this is how the logging strategy ought to be. I don't see logging strategy. I just see that different teams would stand things up and they would take it first in the approach of a higher level of verbosity, maybe when they're troubleshooting, getting something up. And then there's just really the basic logging. And so some events we have lack of telemetry because they're not even configured on the targets. Right. And we didn't manage the targets. There was another, there was a security control team did that. So that concert between the two, and I, that's where I see just the effectiveness of SOX can just be blown up by ineffective standards. And the, it's not just ineffective standards for the enforcement of it. It's really easy to go buy a template off the internet and download it and say, this is my standard for something. But to actually institutionalize that, ensure that's part of a merger and acquisition, make sure the nest des desktops that come out have the exact same standards as the ones that are the previous versions, if not the newer settings. I think that com operational maturity is what helps the SOC a lot too. Like the SOC couldn't do its job if the CMDB system was all messed up and you had no idea what assets were, which is common here. It's Very common. If, you, yep. if you've seen this, that where we do manage detection and response, the alert will come in and we can contextualize either. We use threat intelligence. We have a big platform and tech behind it that does a lot of things. But at the same time, what's normally missing is they would say, I don't know, okay, what is that asset? What is the next level of contextualization need to do? Is that a asset over here? Is it this? It's usually that's where the follow-up, where we usually do with the customer. A lot of times our customers saying, I don't have that. I don't, I, can you do that? Can you do greater contextualization? Can you figure out more things? And it would be great to be able to integrate to a CMDB system, but half the time we find CMDB systems aren't as helpful. It's not as kept up. The data's not there. So what are some of the challenges you've seen of security operations since having to rely, rely on these other systems and technologies and how your decision points can impact them? It's a great question, Josh. And I guess one of the things I just want to step back for a second and talk about to answer that question, you have to understand that a SOC doesn't exist in a vacuum. It should not be a black box function. A really efficient, well-run security operations center, it's all about teamwork. And the teamwork's not just the SOC team. The teamwork is the broader organization. So you need to be working with potentially the operating system towers, the network towers, the guys who manage the firewalls. Because at the end of the day, what a security operations center, our job is to monitor the events that are happening. And if we discover something's wrong, we need to go work with it. The SOC isn't empowered to go change things in a production environment. We have to work through the application teams, the infrastructure teams, et cetera. And the mistake a lot of organizations make, and this is particularly true for the smaller organizations, is they set up the security operations center in a black box. They start getting these events in, and then they start to say, oh, hey, I've got a network problem. I probably should take that router down, make sure it's reconfigured or update it, whatever. But the first time they reach out to the network team is when they found something and they call the network operations center and they say, hey, we got this. And they have no idea who's calling. They have no idea what's going on. So even if you send it over to them, assuming they even open it up and look at it, the first thing they're going to do is reanalyze everything the SOC has already done, which adds time, adds delay time. We talked about dwell time, right? That's going to extend the dwell time because instead of having a trusted relationship with the network tower is going to redo all the work that you were doing in the SOC because they don't know what analysis you did. You haven't been talking with them. And so that is going to add more delay time, more confusion, et cetera. The lesson learned from our standpoint for a lot of different reasons is that when we're designing new use cases, if there's a network use case, we want to bring a couple of people from the network tower in or one person into some of our discussions around, hey, this is the use case or the risk scenario, the threat scenario we're looking at. This is the data we're looking for in the network. Are we logging these types of events? So where you start is by bringing those guys in at the front end and saying, here are the types of use cases we wanna have. Do you guys have some additional use cases we should be considering? You can start to talk about what events should we be logging? Do we have all the right events coming in? Because a lot of times the lead time on updating that logging can be measured in months. If you're waiting for a quarterly window to be able to apply a patch or an update or something or change those parameters, you can wait quite a while to be able to do that. We really think one of the best practices is making sure that you're reaching out and involving those different towers in any of the threats that they might have to respond to. So you're not only working through what's the use case, what data are you looking at, how are you interpreting and analyzing it? Because if you do a lot of that work up front, then you can even at the back end say, hey, Network Tower, when I send this over to you guys, how do you want me to word this? What do you want me to put in there? What documentation? If you work all that stuff out in advance, which doesn't take a lot of time, 
And once you set it up for one event, you can copy and paste that for a lot of the other events. It's just changing a little bit of the content. But then when you go to reach out to that network tower saying, hey, we found something, instead of it being like, who are you guys and where do we start with this? It's, hey, is that thing we were working on? Yeah, okay, great. I'm not gonna start by redoing all your analysis and reviewing anything because we've been talking and working together. And I think that's one of the really key lessons learned is that well done, you're driving a lot of, you're front loading a lot of this collaboration and work that you're doing so that when you're in the moment, when you've got an event you're working on, you've already got the working relationships and the understanding in those towers so that you can function more as a team rather than functioning as, as really siloed towers that don't talk and work together effectively. And I think in the best run socks that I've seen, they've really worked hard to have people understand that everybody's job is cybersecurity and that everybody's gonna have to work together to make this happen. And while the SOC has a role to play in that, it's not the ultimate role. It's more of, a, of an orchestra conductor where we're trying to figure out what's going on and we're trying to bring the right people together to look at this, confirm the analysis, and then to take the steps to remediate it. And I think big lessons learned, but a lot of value that can come out of that if you can collaborate on this rather than just getting them involved at the very end of it, which doesn't work very effectively. Yeah, and, and I also find that your partner strategy for delivery is really the key to success. I'll give you an example. I've been in the middle of some big IRs for and they would have the network infrastructure managed by this other infrastructure team. And so you're in the middle of the IR, you need to find out exactly where that system is at, what's going on with it. And you call up this big warehouse of IT infrastructure management. You got to put a ticket in. And when you talk to them and they get on the bridge, it's to them, okay, it's the IP address. I don't know. I can log on to it. What do you want from me? And it almost is like this commoditization of this service in which there's no real dynamic feedback. Like for instance, we have the ability at Deep Seas, we're working and do a managed detection response, and we can have things like, for instance, we have a Demisto instance on-prem where we can orchestrate a proxy block, for instance. If someone says that this URL needs to be blocked at the proxy, instead of a user going and taking their credentials, going logging onto the product, copy and paste and put into the block, we can do that in an orchestrated manner. We can do that really quick. One of the problems we keep running into in the big organizations is that I know you technologically can do this, but this company only runs by tickets and not to set my pay model here for that vendor. And so what happens is you degrade the actual security, the possibilities of what you could do because your partner model screwed you up and you didn't think about, I want to orchestrate the blocking of this. I know you get paid, so to speak, by how many tickets get created, and that's your business model. So how can we do both? How can I block things? And you still get paid technically for that service. And I think we just have a real challenge with that because I've seen so many jobs or so many big environments and that, that don't have the right partner model go, man, I can orchestrate this. I could do this. I could, I'm sorry, that vendor won't support that. And I'm sorry, that vendor's in charge of that. And I can't see the data here because that's a different company. And it just really breaks down hard. So what have you seen from a, when you start to look at partner in your delivery models and so forth, what are you looking for with the right mix to, to be successful? The key question I'm really looking for in these partners that, that help us manage some of these technical towers is what are their SOAR capabilities? So, so I'm starting to look at what kind of, you know, orchestration and automation can they introduce? Because quite honestly, a lot of the things that you do to support these towers are repeatable. I'm doing the same things over and over. And when people do it, you introduce errors, you introduce delays. But if those people, if those same teams, if those companies, if those partners are investing in some of the automation of some of these functions, so you can say, hey, I need to bring the server down, I need to patch it. But to the extent you can build an automated process to do that, where you can execute this, you know, in a more automated fashion versus having someone have to log in, bring the server, do all this stuff manually can inject a lot of time and delays. Now, obviously you gotta be careful with production boxes, et cetera, but that's really what I'm looking for in a partner. Do they have any kind of capability to automate this? So I don't have to generate a ticket, wait for them to pick it up, what, you know, then they look at it. There's not the same set of urgency when we're dealing with a cyber event that there isn't a standard ticket that comes through with those guys. The other thing I'm looking at is, can I establish specific SLOs or SLAs with either an internal tower or an external tower to say, hey, when you get a security event from me, you're gonna have, if it's a severity one, you've got two hours to look at it and get back to, that's an agreement we're gonna have to have, and I'm gonna hold you accountable to that. That may be different than what you have for other types of events that you're dealing with the network tower, but I'm looking at how extensible is their response model 
where they have the ability to say, hey, a cyber event is going to take a priority. We're going to prioritize it. And I'm going to hopefully, in some cases, if we're working together at the front end to say what's the issue and what needs to be done to fix it, there's the potential that we could build that automation at the front end and test it. And once we've done it a few times, now we can start to rely on that automation. But I want that kind of, of a relationship and I want those kind of capabilities in my partners. Because if I pick a partner not knowing any of that, it, in all likelihood, you may end up with a partner that says, oh, I can't support that. You'll just have to create a standard ticket. Our standard ticket is 24 hours. If you've got a cyber event going on, a standard response doesn't make, it just doesn't, it defies common sense. You need to be able to have, do some exception handling. So I'm really looking at what are the tools, capabilities, processes, and their ability to be able to do that without disrupting the core operations of what the tower is delivering. Those are key questions that you want to be talking to your partners about. And if they don't have those capabilities today, what are they doing to be able to get those capabilities in place quickly enough so that you're not limited by what your partner's capabilities are? Yeah, that's a good point. Especially, and we saw a few IRs where we were prepared to jump in with our customers, but they had a key partner, a key IT partner or whoever who was not responsive, not getting on the phone. They had the admin rights to things. So you can imagine having the SWAT team or a whole truck of firefighters sitting at the door and they can't get the door open because a key IT partner is missing. And having that, not even walking through like a tabletop exercise, I think this is where small businesses really ought to focus on. If you want to know how effective you are, but have a tabletop exercise, simulate breach response. We have a service in which we use breach attack simulation and we uh, there's a product called Blindspot that we use from OnDefend. And we would run that on a host and it simulates a lot of our trade craft, the TTPs that you would normally find. And what we're doing is we're trying to simulate that to see what is the EDR product seeing, what logs are coming back, where did that make it all the way back to the security operations center, did it get dispositioned? Because what we've learned is that it's threats are difficult enough to figure out what's going on, threat actors in different security events in the sea of data that's coming. It's a whole nother event when infrastructure starts breaking and we don't even know it. And the McAfee logs have been down for seven days and nobody told us because it was just enough logs not to trip the data sources being down, but it's really low volume. And all of a sudden we have an incident. We have a security incident. We try to go back into that log source for it and then it's not there. It's not available. Or in the case of Amazon, an incident where we had a bunch of firewall logs that we needed to get back on. I think this was part of one of those celebrity vulnerability solar winds. We needed to be able to pull all these logs. And we had three or we had three months or 90 days hot. And then it went to archive on AWS. And then you would have to rehydrate. So when we went to rehydrate the other nine months of the firewall data, it was $110,000 to do that, the AWS bill. And we only got our data for 30 more days, then it went right back into cold storage. What a miserable experience to try and tell management, yes, in order for me to look here for this data back in these firewall logs that are past the 90 days and go back for the next year, it's going to cost $110,000 and you can only have the data for 30 days. So right away, we made architectural decisions. We're just going hot data for the year, whatever the price is, we're not going to. The rehydration mechanism just really sour us in the middle of an incident. You don't want to be doing that in the middle of an incident. But where some of the lessons you've learned, like these are the two or three things you just don't do. It will eventually implode your sock. It's the things that are the most common that you see, for instance, the philosophical point of throw everything in the sim and then figure it out. What are some of these other things that you've seen that a customer base? First of all, I know you use SLA and SLO. Some people don't really know the difference and so forth. So if you could touch on the difference between the two, I think our listeners would love to, to hear that. But yeah, let me just hit that one quickly. So an SLA is a service level agreement that tends to be binding and SLO is a service level objective. That's a target that you're setting. And I think that's probably the most common when I'm working with clients where they're trying to set some internal. This is where we typically get the CISO and the CIO talking together, not just about budgeting and planning, but our teams need to work together. And rather than negotiate with each team in terms of what the SLOs or SLAs are gonna be, but it's typically SLOs for an internal organization, we'd work with the CIO to say, hey, look, when we have a, a tier one event, we're gonna want a two hour response time or a one hour response time from these type from these towers. We don't wanna negotiate with each one of those. We wanna get that agreement between the CIO and the CISO. And I think not doing that is a real problem because it means you've never established what kind of the ground rules are for how we're gonna to work together and what the timeframes are going to be to work together. Because some towers will be great. They'll jump on this stuff. They'll be super. 
But other towers, they may be overloaded. They may have lost some people, be short of resources. So they're running, they've got a big backlog. They don't know when they're going to get to something. That's just not, you can't run a security operations center where you're loosely dependent. Every tower has a different time frame of responding and you just can't manage and track all that. So getting that established up front between the CISO and the CIO, I think is really important. What are going to be the SLOs? And obviously with a partner, you'd want to try to get those in some type of an SLA where they're going to be accountable that when there's a cyber event, they're going to give me one or two hour response time on the level one problems. And it, certainly we can back off of that for the level two and level three priority problems. You can have more time to deal with it. But the key is to try to establish a common set of those things up front. I think the second thing that we typically see that is problematic is that not enough work is done on defining and tuning the rules. So we end up getting a lot of false positives in the environment. And false positive just waste a huge amount of time for the security operations center. When you spend time working on something that's not a legitimate, it's a false positive, it's just a complete waste of time and resources. And so having an ability to filter out and continue to tune your rules so that you're not spending time working on things you don't have to, Taking that noise out of the system is probably another huge item that I would say can take you from a low level of efficiency to a high level of efficiency in your security operations center. And I think the final area is having well-documented playbooks, run books, and procedures so that when something happens, you've got a predefined procedure that you've agreed on with those technical towers on, here's what I'm gonna do, here's what you're gonna do, here's how we're gonna drive our decision-making, here's how we're gonna work together. But that procedure isn't just a SOC procedure, it's a procedure that includes the tower that's gonna help me do the remediation and that we've worked out what that work is gonna be. And I think the final thing I would say is that a security operations center has to become much better at automating. Even small clients have to be able to find things, find ways to automate things that are highly repeatable whether it's searches or whatever it happens to be, I want to be able to have an automation capability, not completely reliant on scaling my response based on labor. Because labor is the is probably the, the most expensive as well as the most error prone way to deal with cyber events. It's also the most inconsistent because if you got a really good person work on it, they can do something in 10 minutes that it might take a less experienced SOC analyst to take several hours to do. That's the other thing you've really got to work out is when you find a way to do something quickly and efficiently, you got to share that information with the other people on the team, with the other towers, so that everybody can get better at more efficient what they're doing. And monitoring and managing that efficiency, that effectiveness is a key part of running a really good SOC. So I would say those are some of the sort of the four or five basic things that I'd be looking for in terms of make sure you do these things because these things will go a long way towards helping you optimize your operation. Excellent. Yeah. And I think they're just getting that perspective of somebody who's been there and getting that expertise. I think there's always internal team members that think about, OK, I just want to build my own thing. I want to make my mark. I want to build my sock and bring my and they don't think of what's really what's best for the company versus what's best for the resume. And I think there's always a balance act of trying to figure what that is and what's best for an organization. And I guess moving forward for the most most organizations that want to do a maturity assessment, where are you seeing they move fly? Are we really at the level one, level two for maturity? I can tell you what we've seen at deep seas across our environments, it's hit and miss. And sometimes there's an enterprise that you would think just has it together, should the big name brand, Fortune 500, and they're just a disaster. And then you see a small mid-sized company that is doing more advanced things than I've seen at some of the big oil and gas companies. So it's just really, interesting to see how the focus needs to be towards it. What do you think is the difference between those companies? How, why is it that one really gets and one doesn't and one's really effective and one's not? I, th I think it comes down to executive leadership. It is very hard for a manager or a SOC director or something to drive change in their organization. You've got to have strong executive sponsorship. The most success successful programs I've seen came from sponsorship at the top. Sometimes it was at the board level, but certainly it was at a at either a chief risk officer, chief financial officer, chief operating officer, or CEO. You need that that C level sponsorship for this work because again, because you're working across the organization, these are cross functional processes we're putting in place. If you don't have that strong executive sponsorship, you can get buried in all of the battling between the different towers and the politics, and I don't have people to do that. You gotta have some executive sponsorship that helps you cut through that and really drive that. But to do that, you've gotta be able to educate those executives 
in terms of what do we need to be doing versus what we're doing now? Where do they need some help? But if those executives don't understand what you're trying to do, if you haven't educated them on the program and the importance of the entire organization working together and collaborating on this, that's not communicated out, then you end up fighting this battle bottom up and it's not a battle you can win. It's just exhausting to try to fight this bottom up. And it's manageable if you've got executive support with the right informed people at the bottom driving this. You, you can make a lot of good things happen, but it really does require that coordinated response with a strong executive sponsorship and the funding to back up what you're doing. So it's not just saying, hey, we love, let's go and make this happen. It's also going to them with a business case of what can I do to create a cost-effective, efficient capability so I'm being a responsible steward of the organization's funding, but at the same time, I'm communicating what capabilities we have and don't have and what the risks are of not having those capabilities. And here's what we need to do and getting where you need to some support from partners or consultants to be able to help make that case and help educate the executive team on this is where you need to go. This is what you need to be doing. And I think the final thing I would say around that is having a really solid roadmap and a strategy is critical because if you're standing still, you're falling behind with your security operations center capabilities. And even if you're constantly innovating and developing and adding new capabilities, you're still, we're never gonna keep pace with what the attackers and hackers are doing, but absent that, you're really gonna fall behind very quickly. And so again, having this roadmap and strategy on what work needs to be done and making sure the funding's in place, that way you're not battling this because a SOC is a program, it's not a project. And if you fund it at a project level, you're gonna exhaust your team and your management constantly asking for another project, asking for more funding, and you're just taking little bites of the apple rather than saying, this is the funding I need over the next three to five years to drive this program. Let's get it all in place and let's agree on it. And then we don't have to do all this administrative overhead every time we're trying to evolve the SOC. We've already agreed on what the roadmap's gonna be and I've got the executive buy-in to drive that and I've got the funding to support that. And I've got ways of measuring and tracking what I'm doing to demonstrate that over time, I'm getting more efficient, that I'm able to handle each issue more cost effectively, more efficiently with less error rate, and that my people on my team are getting more productive. If you've got those kind of statistics backing you up, generally speaking, you'll get the support you'll need from your organization to get the resource you need, or at least they can make an informed business decision about what investments they wanna to make to balance risk versus being able to offset that risk. I think those are some of the, kind of, some of the key things I'd be looking at. I think that's a, an excellent point. There's three sides of this. So there's the business driver side of that. If there's a board or CEO level initiative that everybody's behind it and everybody's cheering it and everybody knows where it's coming from. I think what happens is when the SOC is just this part of the security department's off on the back, on the back side, they really don't go to any of these business meetings. They don't know any of the business line owners, none of the executives. They're just the guys in the back that are saving the day, doing it in a very heroic manner just because of the lack of funding and resources. I couldn't stand when they would say, we need to solve this and this problem. And by the way, you have no budget. Um, right. But you have no capability of doing that, even though you know you have to have budget. It's obvious. There's not a just I get to work a, a, an hour or two longer every day and somehow that will be resolved. And not giving the proper resources. So I always saw leadership is like a servitude leadership. My responsibility as an executive is to ensure my team have the resources necessary to accomplish the mission that we gave them from a corporate perspective. And not to piecemeal this with a project here or there, but like you said, to develop that program, that executive backing, the communications, showing them how that ties into the overall strategy of the organization and how important this part is, I think makes the maturity of the SOC just continue to grow. I give you this one example, this big farm we do, and we have a heavy company concentration in that space. And I think we were able to be able to opine in several different areas. And I think one of the CISO was asked, the CISO was asking, they were saying, hey, why are we having less events, with less security events now? And we're trending down less and less, but we're seeing industry spikes on third parties, which because we, we would have 30, 40 third party incidents. This one got hit by ransomware. That one got hit by ransomware. It was just constant. It was all part of the supply chain for this pharmaceutical mm -hmm. company. So they had a lot of companies to have to manage. And it was just really difficult. Everybody was getting hit. And it was almost like you're standing by just to get hit yourself. All your peers got hit. It was just a real nervous time period. And what we noticed why we had a different response than the rest of our peers and that because we were managing their entire cyber fusion center 
was because of the attack surface reduction function we had, where it was the good hygiene. It was establishing baselines for configuration for Windows and Linux, understanding the vulnerability management program, infusing that with threat intelligence. So you've threat informed vulnerability management. So we had less attack surface space. And so it really drove down the amount of events that we were occurring because we increased the hygiene, the other side of the coin on that. And it's, you're not going to solve the protection mechanism just by alerting more on the SIM. Just by throwing more data in the SIM does not increase your security. And then how just floods of these events that you may see are chatty at the time, especially any living off the land type attacks, you want to suppress. What if you suppress that wrong and all of a sudden you, you've knocked out a complete level? I've seen that two, three times. We've had red team assessments in some customer environments and nothing, why did that happen? And we come up, find out something got suppressed in the alerting a long time ago. Some SOC analyst didn't like what was going on. And the governance that went into that just made the function just completely insecure and worthless to different minds. So you wonder, how do you continue to have that? I can see where we do an audit and assessment. We go over the rules that have been suppressed. Is that really part of it? But what have you seen that helped where obviously the governance function of a security operations center is important. And if you don't have one, it just seems to be a free for all data and changes and so forth. But you really don't have time in a whole project management team to put a huge massive governance program around it. So what is a good middle ground to say, if I'm gonna do a governance program for my security operations center, I should cover these few items here, concentrate on these first, maybe these later on, but which ones are the foundational or in some websites I can go to or get some more information on it? Yeah, I think the foundational thing we touched on is making sure the CISO and the CIO have done, have had that conversation about how are we going to work together and how are we going to measure the way that it's we're collaborating right. and the effect of that. That's the starting point. Now, over time, you, I want to expand that into a broader cross-functional governance team. That's not a lot of time. But it is a lot of education because I don't want to bring people into a SOC governance council until I brought them up to speed on why are they there? What's the value of it to them? What's the value of it to the organization, et cetera? I want to explain that. But I think establishing a cross functional governance council is important. But I think it starts with the CISO and the CIO. And then you can gradually start to bring in other elements. You can start to bring in maybe the chief risk officer. You can start to bring in some other elements into that group. Maybe you start to bring in the physical security guys, the corporate security guys, and start to build a team of people who are working on similar types of problems. Ultimately, long-term, you could even start to add people like from the fraud tower or from if you've got a financial crimes or you've got user behavior analytics or insider threat teams. You can start to bring those people together so you can start to share and collaborate on what you're doing and how you're doing those things. I, I do want to bring this back to the maturity assessment, though, because I think the other challenge that you've got with management is once you get their executive sponsorship, they're going to want to know how you're progressing. Because for most of these guys, if you're doing what you need to do, you're not going to have major events every day that you can go and say to the executive, hey, look, we have this huge event. Look, I took care of it. And so the question is, I'm spending all this money, but what value am I really getting? I think that's the other part of this is a maturity assessment can be used on a quarterly basis in those cross in those governance meetings to be able to say, hey, look, at the beginning of the year, here's where we were. Here's where we are right now. Here's where we were at the last quarter. Here's what we've accomplished over the last 90 days to improve our, our threat detection, to improve our response. Here's what we've done with dwell time to reduce the time to detect and the time to respond. Having that kind of conversation demonstrates that you're managing the operation, that you're in control of it rather than just reacting to the events. I think the other thing that goes along with this is having other types of measures like financial measures. Am I being, how am I demonstrating? Am I demonstrating that my productivity of my staff is going up? How do I do that? How do I track that to be able to demonstrate that the same group of people I have that last 90 days had a capacity of let's say 100 events a month now can handle 125 or can handle 80, but they're much higher level, higher value types of events which is what we want. I want to be going after the most high value events and that I can prioritize those correctly. So having the right kind of executive reporting and dashboard coming out of the SOC is one of the most important things that you can do to feed that governance council the information they need to know that you're doing the right things, but also to, for the organization to feel good that the money that they're investing in this, it's, it is resulting in improved capabilities, you're doing better at what you're doing and will maintain support for the funding in the program. I think those are really critical things and that maturity assessment can be used to help you track how you're improving those capabilities across the Starting different dimensions. Everything. Absolutely. Yep. 
And Paul, man, it was great having you join me today. Unfortunately, we ran out of time. I feel like I can keep talking to you for another hour. You had a really rich background. I appreciate you taking the time to, to talk to us about this. We've covered a lot of different areas from a maturity assessment, starting off with that, and what are some of the key functions of success or key elements to success? One is that the CISO, the CIO involvement, that executive buy-in that made us a strategic project, a strategic program and not piecemeal through a project and always wondering if funding is going to be there. And it just messes up your long-term strategy. How do you know what your three-year strategy is if the project's only approved for six months at a time? So right. it really gets difficult to do any of those long-term things. So really yeah. want to thank you for being on the show, Paul. I learned a lot and yeah, you have a good day, sir. And the rest of you are on the show, thank you for joining. Please hit that, that comment, trying to grab as many likes and shares and be able to put that on LinkedIn so we can increase that following base. I do I suggest you also check out deepseas.com. We just launched our new website. We have a lot of good information there. We have a threat intelligence feed that's going to be out there really soon too as well. So look forward to uh, seeing you there. And I'll be out at RSA at the end of the month. So if you're going to be there, please hit us up on the show link on LinkedIn. And I'd love to, to be able to meet you. So thank you very much. Stay secure. Thanks, Josh. Take care. Yeah. Thanks for listening to this episode of Cybersecurity America on the Voice America Business Channel. We hope you've learned some valuable information to help you be a better executive leader and navigate today's complex world of cybersecurity. Until next week, stay secure.